Thank you, Pastor, and thank you, Josh. You know, in missions conference, we should give invitations. <clears throat> and I thought it'd be appropriate if anybody would be willing to marry Josh and go to the field with him, we could give an invitation here tonight. And Pastor, we could, we could facilitate this thing, couldn't we? I mean, let's, let's get with the program. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we joke about that. And I, I think of uh, my dear friend, Jimmy Pierre, that you support. Uh, Jimmy has been given so many suggestions about marriage that it becomes old story. And uh, do pray for him. Uh, he is actively seeking God's provision for a wife, and he needs a wife for Haiti. And that is a really big issue for a young man like Jimmy Pierre uh, or Brother Josh that God would provide. So you pray for them. And I'm excited. I uh, appreciate Pastor's encouragement tonight. I want to encourage you with a couple of things. Go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 2. And I want to just share a couple of testimonies by way of encouragement that have been alluded to indirectly in our conference thus far. First of all, COVID deputation missionary support. You know, when COVID began and the lockdowns began, I became very burdened for our deputation missionaries, some who had just been appointed and begun trying to book meetings. And I was absolutely, I have been absolutely amazed that our deputation missionaries have gained support at a more rapid rate under COVID than before COVID. And we are seeing people getting their support quickly. Uh, churches, we have had churches call us and say, we know you can't come, but we're going to take you on support for support. And when you can come, then that will be fine. Folks, that is God showing himself strong and doing a work, even in the face of the opposition of Satan. And so I want to encourage you that things really are going well uh, in the work of God because God is alive and he is doing a work. And I also want to encourage you about divine appointments. I so enjoyed Brother Messler's testimony this morning. And having been there and having seen what God is doing in Kenya, our uh, team that's there uh, working with the folks from IBM, it's, it's very exciting. Uh, but I was thinking about our divine appointments. And this morning I made a statement about the gospel and and, you know, it's not just about going down the street with a pack of tracks that you hand out indiscriminately with people that you don't really have a conversation with. I do believe track distribution is very important, but I believe that we need to look for divine appointments. So let me illustrate it with my trip out here. I always try to pray, Lord, give me an opportunity for the gospel. And I sat down on the plane from Columbia, South Carolina to Charlotte. It's a very short flight, 45 minutes. And there was a very lovely young lady named Julia that sat down and we began to talk. She immediately began to uh, open up to conversation and I engaged her very quickly in that 45 minutes in a wonderful gospel conversation. And though I did not get to go through all of the gospel in detail, I left her with a bridge tract, if you're familiar with that, and I showed her how to read it and study it. And so as we were landing, this uh, graduate student at the University of South Carolina was flipping through reading uh, the bridge tract. Folks, God can give us divine appointments. And I gave her the phone number. You call me when you uh, make this decision. And, and I, I'm praying that God will work in Julia's life. We need to understand that these are days of great opportunity for the gospel. And COVID, which has been such a, a down uh, experience for all of us is bringing the world to a hopelessness that they've had all along. And we can be a people of faith, we can trust God, and we can go forward. And these are wonderful days to be serving the Lord. So I just want to encourage you uh, about what God is doing in our little part of the world, Baptist World Mission. Tonight, we're looking at the first Christians fellowshipping. And you may say, boy, this sounds like an unusual title for a missions conference. But I think it really fits well with where we are today in what God is doing in the world. So we're going to go to Acts chapter 2. And I would like to begin reading uh, kind of where we left off this morning, uh, verses 42 through 47. So, of course, Peter has preached the gospel on the day of Pentecost. And it says in verse 41, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized... And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. This is the birth of the New Testament church. 3,000 saved. 
3,000 baptized. You say, where did they get baptized? I alluded this morning to all of those baptismal pools at the southern steps of the temple complex. It would have been very easy for that group of 120 to baptize 3,000 in a very short period of time in all of those baptismal pools. And it said they were baptized, they were added to the church. And then it says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Let's pray tonight as we open this wonderful text. Father, I pray that you would teach us tonight from your word. Father, stir our hearts for the priority of the fellowship of the local assembly and how it relates to the work of God from the neighborhood to the nations. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. This morning we saw that uh, the Bible is our compass. It is that infallible guide when the world around us tries to get us to have a wrong focus, we go back to the Bible. So what we're doing In these four messages, we're looking at the book of Acts, at the church at Jerusalem, how they went from their local neighborhood to the nations, and it's called the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the first volume of church history. It's the link between the Gospels and the epistles, as we saw this morning. And this morning, we studied what happened on the day of Pentecost and and the message of Peter, and we identified that the first Christians were very active in the pulpit and from house to house preaching the gospel. And we identified what that gospel is, and 3,000 people got saved. Well, the early church kind of had a problem similar to Josh's problem. What do you do with people who are saved but need to be taught? And so here we have the beginning of the fellowship of the New Testament church. Now, let me look at one verse with you, if you would, please. And I want to identify what uh, some theologians, there's not total agreement on this, but some theologians have identified in this verse. They agree that in verse 42, it says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Most commentators will agree that there are three activities here that are very specific. That is the doctrine, the uh, breaking of bread, and prayers. We understand what those are. The fourth one is fellowship, and it's a very generic term in many people's thinking. So many Bible scholars say that, that what you have here in this verse is the core concept of fellowship in the local church, and the three other activities are actually what they did as they fellowshiped. And I think there is some legitimacy to that uh, interpretation of this verse. So we're going to look at that somewhat from that perspective tonight. But I want us to begin by talking about fellowship. What is fellowship? Fellowship is not two fellows in the same ship. If that were the case, then there would be no need for any kind of agreement or unity at all. That, That can't be the case. Fellowship, if you're from the South is Baptist eating together. That is not the biblical definition of fellowship. Well, if it's not two fellows in the same ship, and if it's not having a potluck, what is fellowship? One theologian defined it this way, fellowship may generally be defined as the spiritual duty of believers to encourage one another to holiness and faithfulness by meeting and carrying out the worship and service of Jesus Christ. And I think that's a pretty good definition. The basic word for fellowship here means a partnership or a sharing. Folks, when you get saved, you come into partnership with Jesus Christ. 
And it is the plan of the Savior who left behind His program for this age called the, fellowship, uh, called the local church that you not only have a partnership essentially with Him, but you have a partnership practically with other believers in something called the local church. God's plan for this age is the local church, and it is to be the center of fellowship. Now, why do I say that? A believer should not be getting his primary fellowship through social media. Did you know it's interesting to me, a lot of young men, Josh, that I have encountered going to the mission field have advocated raising their support not by going to local churches, but by doing it through social media. And you know what they've found? They've been doing this for a few years. They can gain their support very quickly through social media, but they can lose it even more quickly through social media. Because social media is not a source of solid relationship. So, so God's plan for you, Christian, is not to abandon the local church and find your fellowship in social media. That is a dead-end street. God's plan for you for fellowship is not community Bible study groups. Now, I'm not saying that community Bible study groups are wrong, but so many times they are ecumenical in nature, and therefore they have to leave out vital doctrines and they become very shallow. And it's easy for people to forget that God has ordained the local church, and we're going to find out the first point of this fellowship is continuing in all of the apostles' doctrine. So we're not to get our fellowship through community Bible study groups, the primary fellowship. And also you are not to get your primary spiritual fellowship exclusively through your own family. You know, the, the concept today of family churches and the father being the high priest of the family is not a biblical concept. God has ordained the local church as a body. And so it's very important for us to understand that this is how the early church did ministry. And folks, we do not have the prerogative to say, well, I know that God did it that way, and I know that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, but I've got a better idea. We do not have that prerogative. So we're looking tonight at the first Christians fellowshipping. So number one, I want you to see in our text the members of the first fellowship. The membership of the church at Jerusalem was both exclusive and inclusive. You say, well, that's a contradiction of terms. Not at all. Notice, first of all, that the membership was exclusive. It was only those who were saved and baptized. Now, folks, we are not saved by baptism. Baptism is a work of obedience after salvation. But in the New Testament, baptism is a requirement for being a part of the local assembly. That is taught in this text. Look at verse 41. Then they that gladly received His word, that means they got saved, were baptized, notice the order, and the same day they were added unto the church. So the pattern in New Testament membership in a local assembly, verse 37, we saw it this morning, they were convicted by the Holy Spirit once they heard the gospel. Verse 38, they were converted, uh, repentance and faith. And then in verse 41, they obeyed the Lord in baptism and they were then added to the church. And that is a biblical formula for local church membership. Why is that important? Because membership is exclusive to those who are regenerated those who have been born again. And baptism is something that is very important for obedience to those who've been born again. Uh, if you haven't read it, let me encourage you to read Dr. David Beale's book, uh, The Mayflower Pilgrims. Dr. Beale is a, a writer, a theologian, a Bible professor, a wonderful man of God. He's still living. But he wrote a little booklet called The Mayflower Pilgrims. And there he traces uh, what happened with the, the pilgrims who came from, from uh, England to uh, the colony of Massachusetts and founded that colony and what happened to them religiously. And it's very interesting. He traces there that in 100 years, the pilgrims went from relative orthodoxy to Unitarianism, which is total denial of Jesus Christ. How did they do that? He gives three ways they did that. And I don't have time to develop those tonight. They're all three very interesting topics. You'll have to read the book. 
But one of them was the fact that they, they ended up with an unregenerate church membership. You see, when they, when they left the back streets of Holland and they came to Massachusetts, they founded a state church, and everyone was a member of the state church. And that first group in the beginning, most of them were believers. But their children were born into the state church. It became known as the halfway covenant. And so they became members in their unregenerate state, uh, in the church, you have unregenerate membership. So by 100 years, the church was totally Unitarian. And folks, one of the greatest safeguards to this ministry is this church insisting on the, exclusivit, uh, the exclusivity of regenerate church membership. You must be born again. You know, your children need to be born again. You need to be burdened for these young people in the school and in the church that they would really have a new birth experience. Because folks, if they grow up as good Baptists but are never born again, they will spend eternity in hell. The regenerate membership of the church. It's the foundation of the fellowship. Secondly, membership here is inclusive. What do I mean by that? Look at verse 39. Peter says at the conclusion of his message, for the promise of salvation is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off. In other words, Peter is preaching to come into the church, you have to be saved, but whosoever will may come and be saved. So while our membership is exclusive, our, our vision, our purpose must be inclusive. We want to see everybody saved. Now, folks, I realize that there may even be people here that will... Uh, want to debate the issue that I'm going to say, but I personally believe that the Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And I believe absolutely I can present the gospel to any sinner, and I must be burdened that it be presented to every sinner, because God says, whosoever will may come. And that demands that we be missionary. It is the concept of going from the neighborhood to the nations. So the membership of this fellowship was first exclusive, and secondly, it was inclusive. But then the main body of the message tonight I want you to see is the maintenance of this first fellowship, and that's found in verse 42. As I pointed out earlier, uh, there is a theological basis for... Uh, having fellowship to be the core issue here, and the other three issues uh, flowing out of that being the ministry of that. So let's talk about that. First of all, what is the key to maintaining the health of the church relating to this concept of fellowship? Number one, it is the fellowship of meeting. This word fellowship, this word partnership demands the concept of meeting together. And we find it in verse 41. It says, Then they that gladly received His word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls, and they continued steadfastly. What did they continue in? All of these things. One of them is fellowship, and they didn't have Zoom, and they didn't have FaceTime. It was a fellowship of meeting. And I would submit to you that faithfulness to Jesus Christ and the fellowship of His church is a mark of genuine salvation and discipleship. So let me say that again. Faithfulness to Jesus Christ and the fellowship of His church, the meeting of His church, is a mark of genuine salvation and discipleship. You say, Brother Stephen, how can you say that? In 1 John 2, 9, John the Apostle wrote these words. They went out from us, that it might be made manifest that they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. John is saying that those who abandoned the fellowship of the church were manifesting that they were never God's children to begin with. Now, can there be people saved who are not part of a local assembly? I believe there are saved people who are untaught, who have a wrong view of the local church, and I believe they'll be in heaven someday. But folks, people who willfully repudiate their need for other believers 
bring reproach to the, to the teaching and the name of Christ in what he has done in founding the church. It's disobedience to God. It's direct disobedience. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, the writer says, Consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Folks, God has ordained the fellowship of meeting. And COVID has really attacked that concept. Uh, whether it is the result of, of lockdowns or whether it is the result of fear where people are out of church and they won't come because of fear. And, and God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Folks, God has ordained meeting. It is the fellowship that is at the core of what a church is. So I want to challenge you to realize the importance. You see, some have lost the vision of being in Sunday school or growth groups. Some have lost the vision of being at prayer meeting. Some have lost the vision of being here when service opportunities occur. And folks, that is not God's design. God wants there to be a fellowship of meeting, and faithfulness to that meeting is part of your testimony of true conversion. So it's very important. Number two is the fellowship of ministering. And I pointed out that there are three other activities here that really help us define what fellowship is in a very practical way by way of ministering. So these are individual gifts that are being exercised here. But we need to remind ourselves that the church is a corporate body. And though there are many members, there is one body. Remember Paul talks about the church like a human body. The fingers need the toes, the eyes, the ears. Every part of the fellowship of ministering is a part of the fellowship. It is interdependence. Pastor French, of course, was for 12 years my right-hand guy at Community in South Bend, Indiana. And I love and appreciate uh, Pastor and Mrs. French and their children. And uh, I mean, it goes beyond that. But I can tell you, if, if you want to hear any really interesting Mark French stories this week, please feel free to come and see me. I have a lot of them that I can share with you. But he will remember that in our doctrinal statement of our church constitution, that we have it spelled out that the ministry of Community Baptist Christian School, the ministry of Master Clubs and the Bus Ministry and the Sunday School, all of those are not independent ministries. They are a part of the whole body fellowship of the church. Now, why is that important? It is so easy in a Christian school for a teacher to think, this is my class. Or for a music director and Brother Caleb doesn't think this way, I know, to think this is my choir or whatever. And, and we, we, we sectionalize the work of God to where it's about us rather than about Christ. And folks, it should never be that way. It is a unified part of the body and every member is important and every ministry is a part of the church. And we need to remember that. So what are the three key ministries presented here? Number one, the ministering of the Word. And whether it is the pulpit ministry, whether it is Sunday school teaching, whether it is uh, the young people being mentored in their youth programs, there is to be the proclamation and the explanation of the Word. We continue in the Apostles' Doctrine. Folks, doctrine is important. And doctrine is not boring. Because ultimately, all doctrine is an exposition of the person and work of Jesus Christ. And He is not boring. So we understand this ministry of the Word. And can I say that Scripture, the Word of God, is the food for the believer's growth and power. And the church cannot operate on truth that it has not been taught. And the fellowship cannot function on principles that they have not learned. Therefore, there must be the ministry of the Word. It's a vital part of the fellowship. Secondly is ministry to Christ. 
It's very interesting. In Acts 13, that great passage, which is the beginning of the New Testament missionary movement, where, where Paul and Barnabas are sent out, it says of the church at Antioch, as they ministered to the Lord. You know, sometimes we don't think about that. But every ministry that is done in the local church, if it is done biblically, is to the Lord. You know, when pastor preaches a message, he's preaching to you, but really his number one audience is Jesus Christ. And if it's done right, when a lady is in the nursery and she is changing the dirty diapers of your children... If she is doing it for the right purpose as a part of the body and the advance of the body, she is doing it to the Lord and for the Lord. And that's exactly what is being spoken of there in Acts 13. All of the ministries of the church were to be done to the Lord. And here he talks about it. He talks about, uh, in verse 42, and in breaking of bread. Breaking of bread, the Lord's table is probably the most intimate ministry to the Lord that we have in the local church, other than maybe prayer, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. But when we remember Him, and, and it's the cup and the bread, and we partake of the elements, we do this in remembrance of Him until He come. It draws our hearts to worship to Him. Everything in the ministry of the church should be to the Lord. I was telling Pastor French, I have a dear friend in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, who pastors Heritage Hills Baptist Church, and I love the tagline they have on their church buses and on their sign. He said, it says, Heritage Hills, the church where it's all about God and not about you. And you know what, folks? That's the way it ought to be ministering to the Lord. So ministering the Word, ministering to Christ, and then ministering in prayer. Look at verse 42. It says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. Prayer is the slender nerve that moves the muscles of omnipotency, one writer has said. We move God through prayer. Understanding the sense of loss that his disciples were going to feel as they anticipated his going away, Jesus said to them in John 14, Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. God has ordained the church to be a place of prayer. I was so blessed last night. We have a uh, a young friend we've never met, but there are so many connections I can't even begin to mention them. A young lady named Tony Phillips who uh, this week went through, went through two 12-hour brain tumor surgeries. Uh, she's the wife of a youth pastor in uh, the uh, Augusta, Georgia area, and we have a lot of connections to her family. So I was mentioning it to Pastor French and Susie, and he said, you know, we prayed for her Wednesday night. And I thought, what an amazing thing that people in a congregation in Arizona bow their knee to the God of eternity for a precious young lady who's serving Christ in Augusta, Georgia. We should be a place of prayer. That's the ministry. And that is not accomplished if we divide ourselves and we never gather and we never love each other face to face. We, we gather together in a fellowship of ministering the Word and ministering to Christ and ministering in prayer. It is the fellowship of how the first Christians did ministry. Can I say to you tonight that meeting is essential for a New Testament church? Can I say that this church is an essential business in COVID definition as far as God is concerned, and we need to understand that it is essential. So there is the members of the fellowship and then the maintenance of the fellowship. Finally, and we've got about 10 minutes if I calculated my time right tonight, uh, the manifestations of this fellowship. And in verses 43 through 47... Uh, the writer Luke gives us six manifestations of what this fellowship looks like. When people come together and they're organized into a church for the cause of Christ, so that in the neighborhood they can present Christ and take Christ then to the nations, what does it look like? And he gives us six of those. Number one, 
There is in that kind of a congregation a spiritual reverency. Look at verse 43. And fear came upon every soul. What's he talking about? These gatherings were characterized by a reverential awe that flowed from a sense of the presence and the power of God. The word phobos here, from which we get our word phobia, refers to a holy terror that came upon all who were touched by the church because they knew that God was there. You know, it's very interesting. In Acts chapter 5, you have the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And twice in this pass- that passage, the same word is used, and that was fear came upon the unsaved. Now, why did fear come upon the unsaved at the church at Jerusalem? Because even lost people knew that the power of God was among those believers at Jerusalem. And they were so fearful of God judging their sins like He'd judged the sins of Ananias and Sapphira. So there was a fear, a reverential holy terror one commentator said, because of the presence of God. Let me ask you the question. Is God present at Northwest Valley Baptist Church? I mean, I think that's a really important question. And the second question which would flow out of that, is this community aware that the presence of God is here? You know what, folks? There is so much going on in contemporary Christianity that is driving away the presence of God. Because carnality never produces spirituality. It can't. And so we need to ask the question, do we have a spiritual reverency? The fear that comes by the presence of God. Number two, there was a practical charity, verses 44 and 45, and all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. This is not a primitive form of communism, as some have said, because they didn't all sell everything at once and put it in a communal pool. They sold as there were needs. And you know, I think that's still very legitimate for the church today. You know, the church has a building program, and you have assets that you can liquidate and give to the building program. Uh, You have Christian benevolence that's needed in the church. You can give to other believers because they don't have and you do. That is not Christian communism. That is Christ-like charity. And the church was marked by it. Number three, there was a sacrificial consistency. So let me ask you this question. Look at verse 46. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple. Now, they didn't have a church building yet, but they met in Solomon's porch in the temple. And that's where they gathered, where the church gathered. And this was already a church, even though they didn't have a building, and they were meeting daily. A sacrificial consistency that they met daily. I wonder how many of us would be faithful... If we, as, if you as a church came to the conviction that God wanted you to have services daily here, maybe that will happen sometime in the midst of the needs of our nation or the needs of this community. This was something new in the book of Acts. But they met daily, and they were willing to make that sacrificial consistency. I wrote in my notes that asking the question, is the church important to you? Is it important enough to you to sacrifice time and money in order to be faithful? That which is important produces consistency. That which is unimportant to us produces inconsistency. Now you understand that. I mean, this is not rocket science. You know, if if it's really not important for you to go to that ball game... You know, I mean, you kind of like the team, and if it works out, fine. But it's not something that's a priority. You will be very inconsistent in going to the game. But if you are a season ticket holder Alabama fan from Tuscaloosa, it's a different story. Importance produces consistency. Unimportant produces inconsistency. And that's really what is being talked about in the text. Are you consistent in your giving? Are you consistent in your attendance at the church? Are you sacrificially consistent to whatever God calls upon your church to do by way of meeting, however frequently it is?
And then number four, we've got to hurry. There was a joyful radiancy. Look at verse 20 at 46. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. This word gladness is the same word that was used by the angel when he announced to Zacharias the birth of John the Baptist. It's called being really excited about something. It, it is joy that cannot be suppressed. And I'm probably going to cry when I use this illustration. Our youngest daughter, Hannah, and her husband have been married 10 years. They've had three miscarriages. For each of those babies, we prayed, and when each of them passed away, we wept. And she is now 26 weeks into her fourth pregnancy, and it is going wonderful. And I pray fervently every day for little baby Bowers. And I tell you, when that baby girl is born and is healthy, you will hear the shout of Bud Steadman from Huntsville, Alabama. That's what this word gladness means. Do we feel that way about the work of God? Are you glad when people get saved? Are you glad when you hear that God has met a need? Is there joy in your heart? That was the manifestation of this early fellowship. Number five, an uncomplicated simplicity. And I know I'm going to offend some folks here on this, but, but that's okay. Look at verse 46, the latter part. They did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. This word singleness here is very interesting. It is only used three times in the New Testament. At the core, it is the idea of folding a garment once. And I illustrate it sometimes this way in talking about this word, uh, the Greek word aplus. Uh, my wife, when she folds the towels in our bathroom, I mean, they go over like this and they go over like this and they go over like that. And, you know, they're, they're really cool. That's not the way I fold a towel. Once over, I'm done, okay? That's the meaning of this word singleness. Now, to illustrate it better relating to the church, uh, junior high girls, this is where the offense will come in, junior high girls do not meet the qualifications of singleness here. What do I mean by that? Junior high girls' relationships are very complicated. When my daughter Sarah, who's, it's today's her 41st birthday, she was in junior high in North Carolina. She had two cousins who were her best friends, Melissa and Allison. And so when Melissa was speaking to Sarah, Allison wouldn't speak to Sarah. And when Sarah was speaking to Allison, Melissa wouldn't speak to Sarah. I mean, it was tears every day coming home from school, this relationship. It was so complex. I mean, you would have thought it was like a meeting at the UN over something major, and we had tears every day. That is not the meaning of this word singleness. Here's what the word means. In the church, people said, I love you, you love me, we love Christ. Not cliques, not our little group over here that, you know, don't come and interrupt our fellowship over here, you know. But rather, we are one body in Christ and with singleness of heart, a unity, a love. It's very simple. We love Christ, therefore we love each other. That's the church that went from the neighborhood to the nations. That's the church that had people around it fearing because the power of God was there. And a disunity that is not over doctrine or things that are essentials robs the people of God of the power of God. So they had an uncomplicated simplicity. And then finally, they had a productive testimony in verse 47. It says, praising God and having favor with all the people. Now, who are all the people? Uh, as best we know, this is talking about all the Jews because the word people commonly is used of the Jews and this was a Jewish community. So we're talking about the unsaved Jews around him. This is not compromise. This is not becoming like the world to win the world. But rather their testimony was so genuine that God gave them favor with people. Now how does that work? Uh, Mahatma Gandhi, some of you know, have read his biography perhaps, is very interesting. He was exposed to the gospel while he was a student in Great Britain. And during that time, this is what he said. 
He said, I like your Christ, but I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. And Mahatma Gandhi died and went to hell. So these believers here at Jerusalem were so like Christ that when people were drawn to Christ, they were drawn to the Christians. And people were being saved. Neighbors to nations. Can I say that your neighbors watch you? I know that because my neighbors have told me they watch me. We've had a neighbor tell me, we see you go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, every week that you're here. You're going to church. They watch your church attendance. They hear your words in the backyard, whether you realize it or not. Your words of kindness or words of bitterness. They watch how fast you drive through the neighborhood and whether or not you keep your property up. Do we not realize, folks, that we are living in glass houses when we name the name of Christ? And this church at Jerusalem was so following Christ and walking with Christ that the people saw that they were genuine and real and they were drawn to that and God gave them favor. And so what happened? Verse 47, And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Let me close with an illustration about why it is so important. And, and forgive me, it's an illustration about our family in South Bend, but I've never been anybody else, so I can't tell you other stories firsthand. Uh, I don't know if Pastor and Susie uh, knew the Squadroni family across the street from us. They were a Catholic family in our neighborhood. We lived about a mile from the church. And South Bend, Indiana was 75% Catholic, uh, many of them very orthodox, some nominal. Uh, the Squadronis were very Orthodox Catholics, and when you would try to reach out to them, they didn't want to have anything to do with the Baptist. We lived across the street. Our kids would play with their kids when they were permitted. We had some Catholics in the neighborhood that wouldn't even let our kids play with their kids, even though we tried to reach out to them. Squadronis were a little standoffish, but we tried to reach out to them. Their nine-year-old daughter came down with meningitis and went into the hospital. It was very serious. My wife baked some goodies. We bought her a teddy bear, and we went to the hospital to visit this nine-year-old daughter when we knew her parents were there. You know, we watch our neighbors too. And uh, we went, and we presented that, and I said to them, can I pray for her? And I prayed fervently for this young girl, and you know what? God raised her up off the bed of affliction. She was in the hospital for a couple of weeks. You know what they told us after we did that? They said, our priest never came to the hospital that whole time our daughter was there. Now, they didn't get saved while we were there. But I think they saw that there were some Baptist people across the street who loved Jesus and who loved them. And folks, that is one of the ways we will impact neighbors and nations. But it's got to begin with the right relationship to Christ. It's got to begin with the right relationship to the local body. It's got to begin with the power of God. And so I would challenge you, be faithful in your fellowship with Christ. Be faithful in your fellowship with one another. And see God do great things as you see neighbors saved and as you see the gospel going to the nations through your ministry.